Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy Jeremy Cohen here for another episode of Cap Rules Everything Around Me. Cream, get the money, dollar dollar bills, y'all. We are eight days, less than that, really, away from the NBA trade deadline where, you know, the Knicks are rocking and rolling. They have won 13 of the last 15 games. They were 13 and one in games that Jalen Brunson played in the month of January. And we're welcoming a new month in a day. Some of us listening to this might have already welcomed in the new month. But I got to tell you, January, kind of wish the Knicks didn't have to leave it because it was pretty great for them. And what's on the other side, of course, is February, which will have some exciting moments. One being that Jalen Brunson will be named to an all-star game. Julius Randle uh, hopefully could be named and then just not play as the injury uh, that he's facing and doesn't hurt anyone. And of course, the trade deadline, which is coming up. Now, I am fascinated by the various ways the Knicks could go about this. And there's something to be said of, hey, the Knicks are rolling along. There's no reason to do anything. Just keep it as is. And I totally understand that. I also think having more options than not, probably beneficial, especially if you could find a way to turn Fournier into continuous soup. The big question that I have is, will the New York Knicks decide to go into the tax this year? The answer, I don't really know. I think they will not, just based on the fact that it's not something they've done before. They have been very cautious about that tax line. If you're wondering what does the tax do, well, it's extra money, of course, that ownership would be paying. And you've got the repeater tax, which is three of the next four years. If you're in the tax, then you get hit with more taxes. And it's just not a pretty thing if you're a team. And the goal, of course, is if we can avoid it, then let's do it. And the Knicks have clearly built a winning team that does not need to be in the tax. So from their vantage point, it could be, well, if we don't have to, if we can save ownership money, then that's great. We won't. We won't go into it. And you might be thinking, well, why should I care about James Dolan's pocketbooks and uh, or his pockets? And I would tell you right now, you don't have to. You're under no obligation to feel any sympathy towards any of the owners or the governors from spending as much money as they possibly could. It's better for the league. It's better for fans, better for everyone when they spend. But with that repeater tax, if you can avoid it, then you might as well consider avoiding it. But what I'm curious about is if the Knicks wanted to do anything where they say, you know, the tax is typically for teams that are contender status. And looking at how good the Knicks are, do they consider themselves contender worthy enough to say, you know, let's uh, let's spend. Now's the time. We're not hurting our long term future. It's just more money. Let's go for it. And I think as fans, that's something that we would want to see. But it's something that if ownership, front office, if they decided we're not going to go into the tax, it's not happening. I wouldn't love it because, again, to me, this is still entertainment. But I would understand it from a financial aspect perspective of why that might not be the case. But it's noteworthy because the Knicks right now are a little over six, around six million dollars towards the tax. Of course, probably cut into it a little bit because they signed Taj Gibson to a 10 day contract, which hasn't been reflected in my books, but certainly online, which I can double check. Uh, and then as a result, they're probably somewhere in the $10.6 million range, maybe, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more uh, where it's from the apron. Of course, the tax apron is the point where the Knicks can't spend any more than that because of, Dante DiVincenzo, which no one's going to complain about. But, and that that was triggered, of course, by the mid level exception that they had. But in terms of where the Knicks are at, it's really that roughly $6 million mark where it'll be fascinating to see if they go above it. I don't think they will. My prediction is that they will not go above it, but worth seeing, worth considering if they will do something of the sort. Other than that, you know, there's been certainly some talk, but maybe it's the calm before the storm. Michael Scotto of Hoops Hype talked about some rumors that involved the Knicks. It seemed as though a lot of those, and maybe not, I could be completely wrong here, but that they may have been a little bit more dated, uh, specifically that the conversations that were had between the Knicks and the Jazz regarding Jordan Clarkson and Kelly Olynyk, uh, those were held in, earlier in January. So 
maybe things have changed since then. Maybe they haven't. But of course, the Knicks are in a different place than they were, which is in a more winning place. Uh, DeJounte Murray and AJ Griffin. Hard to know exactly when those conversations came up. I'm at the point where, and maybe it's just because the Knicks are winning. I'm not super antsy about the deadline. In past years, I would probably have stress dreams or like it consume all of my thoughts. And there's still time for them for that to happen. I'll be on standby for a few days, as will John, as will Andrew. And it'll be a fun time when the Knicks decide to break news during a work day or very late at night when people are about to go to bed. But that's that's for later. In the meantime, uh, it's not something that's really registered yet. It hasn't hit me and it usually does. So I'm probably alone in that. But winning typically solves all. And the Knicks have been doing a lot of winning. So that's my one big thing for the day. I'm excited to join you all, answer any questions, receive comments, feedback, whatever it might be. Let's do it. First question, Andrew P. Hey, Jeremy, been dreaming about how Caruso would look on this team. Why he's not an option for Grimes. Uh, why is he not an option for Grimes plus picks? It'll cost too many picks. Wouldn't anybody want him in a star trade? Caruso is an excellent player. No doubt about it. The factor of getting Caruso comes down to money in a lot of ways, specifically the salary portion. So the Knicks, as things currently stand, you know, if they wanted to get Caruso, let's just play along. Grimes is what uh, Andrew suggested. Okay. Well, you have to add other salary to Grimes to make that work. Well, you can't add the next highest salary or the one after that, Malachi Flynn or Precious Achua, respectively, because they cannot be aggregated for the deadline. Those are players that can be traded individually, but not aggregated together. And then the next highest salary is Isaiah Hartenstein, which would be $9 million. And the Knicks aren't going to trade Isaiah Hartenstein. So then you can probably go about this two ways. The first is that the Knicks package Fournier and Grimes for Caruso and still someone else probably i mean it depends on who the math would, be, would how the math would shake out to get that player uh, it's tricky to do that i'm not saying it's impossible but there are a lot of moving pieces you have to get the right combination of players you might need a third team um, it's an option option one it's viable all things considered option two is that the knicks could do kind of like a sidestep thing which is trading out some salary for more salary to then trade out that salary for Caruso. For example, let's say the Knicks had Malachi Flynn and they didn't want Malachi Flynn anymore because they didn't necessarily need him. They have players in-house, the goal is Caruso. Okay, so we're moving Malachi Flynn, but Flynn for Caruso, not going to work. So what you could do is you could call up a team, say like Atlanta. Atlanta says, we've got Patty Mills. He's an expiring free agent. We're not going to retain him. We'd also like to shave some money off of our payroll. Let's do a swap. And the Knicks trade Flynn for Mills. Okay, now the Knicks have Patty Mills. Now, do they have enough money to get from Patty Mills, who can't be aggregated with other players, and get Alex Caruso with the same money? It should work. I think it should work because it's worked with Alec Burks, who's making probably a touch more than Caruso. So that is an option the Knicks could do. And if they just did that, then they might just be able to squeak under the tax depending on what else they do. Of course, you could then potentially move Grimes out in another deal and save money. So like that's the sort of thing that could work. So you have to be a little creative about Caruso. The thing with Caruso, yes, I mean, if you got him, you're in a great spot. And absolutely, another team might want him in a star trade. The question, of course, is, is it, worthwhile for the Knicks, and this is kind of the DeJounte Murray conversation. Is it worthwhile for the Knicks to trade strong assets, picks, for a player to then package that player for fewer picks, or with fewer picks, for a star? It could be that the team that's trading said star just wants the draft equity and doesn't want to get say a 30-year-old, or however old Caruso is, in that deal um, as a prize. Unsure. But I get the understanding for why he's a great player. Obviously, you could, you could slot him in there, but I don't know if he's quite the same lead guard that the Knicks might be looking for. He's more 
off ball, but can play on ball, but just great talented player. I just don't think he'll be cheap, but uh, it's a great question, Andrew. Uh, to Jester, wow, thank you very much for the generous Super Chat contribution. Knicks, Bruce Brown, and Alec Burks, Raptors, Fournier, 2024 Dallas first, 2025 Brooklyn second. Uh, the Pistons, they get Malachi Flynn, Quentin Grimes, 2024 Jazz second. Separate Flynn like we did with OG into the Pistons TPE. Need Flynn for matching money. I'm going to trust that this works. This goes to, I couldn't have planned this better if I had tried. Thank you uh, to Jester. This goes into the conversation of the tax. I have tried to rework it to see, is there a way to get Brown and Burks into uh, onto this team and not go into the tax without giving up too much? And it's really tough. It's I'm almost positive that this trade would add more money than that tax line. And again, if you feel like I don't care, I shouldn't care, I'm not even going to disagree with you. There's, there's a very similar sentiment that I have, just spend. But I get the limitations. And I think that this trade does solve certain issues, 100%. It adds more talent in. It makes me feel a little bit better about losing Quentin Grimes because you're bringing in win-now talent. And you can at least have Burks roll off. You could use his bird rights to re-sign him for fairly cheap this summer. Uh, you could package Brown in a star trade. There's a lot of pieces here, which is why I am also of the mindset of do this type of move if you're going to, fine. But let's just let's ignore the tax. And so it keeps going back to that point of is that threshold something they're going to pass? Um, there's there are other ways of getting it. Like, look, yes, could they move? Jericho Sims, Ryan Archdiakon, like there are ways to do it where it's, hey, just for the better of the team. But you also need a certain amount of players on the roster for it to work. You can't dip under a certain amount. So it, this is one of those deals. I totally get it. I, I think it's valid. It's just a matter of the tax and why I don't think it will happen. But I would like to be pleasantly surprised because it means that the Knicks are willing to spend more. Um, but thank you for the soup chat. This is a great question. Um, really appreciate it. Hans Boozy Jr. Anything there with Mikal to the Knicks? If not, who are top three realistic targets not named Bruce Brown or Brogdon? I have maintained that I don't see anything happening with the Nets and the Knicks. They have not made a trade since uh, the first Reagan term. If there were a trade to be made, it would probably be lower end. Like, hey, trade you your distant second round pick for the rights to a player that was drafted ages ago like that sort of mindset but if you're brooklyn what exactly is the benefit of trading your best player to a crosstown rival that gets to join his fellow villanova teammates uh, gets to be on the team that's what's right now the third best in the eastern conference and would presumably be even better than that if I'm Brooklyn, I'm thinking, no, I'm. that's an embarrassment. Optics-wise, it's terrible. We, we can't do this. If Brooklyn wouldn't even trade Bridges to the Grizzlies last year, to Houston for their own picks, some of their own picks back, then they'd have to be completely bowled over by the Knicks. I don't think a Knicks tax exists. I'm just going to be honest. I see it floating around a lot. I think that Nick's tax is really just like a fun way for people to ignore that we are fans and we love our players and uh, the assets that this team has, but it's not really a thing. And Hans, this is not you. Don't worry. You're good. It's more just a general comment. It doesn't seem like it's something that exists. It's, it's really more just like it, maybe it used to, maybe at a certain point when the Knicks were truly terrible, uh, that was something that was thought of, hey, we could take advantage of this team. And I think some of the reporting, like with the Danny Ainge, Jazz, Grimes reporting outside of Michael Scotto, some things that have been floating online, if it's believable, if it's true, it's we're past the point where there's a quote-unquote Knicks tax. I just don't see how that's relevant. But in this case, I think it would actually matter because it's not just like the quote-unquote Knicks. It's you're our division rival. And it also, like even more so, you're a crosstown rival. And I think the crosstown portion is what matters. And the Nets don't exactly want to wake up and look at the back page of the Post or anything on the Daily News uh, 
and say, oh, wow, yeah, we that player, we we traded them away for players who could be better maybe one day than Mikal Bridges, but um, I just don't. I don't see it. I really don't see it. I, it's nice to dream because of the, the Nova connection, but I just I don't think there's anything there whatsoever. And in terms of top three realistic targets not named Bruce Brown, it's another good question. There, I mean Clarkson, who did not play well, of course, uh, certainly an option, but salary wise, would make sense to trade him this year. As opposed, like th- trade him uh, before, like in between the the draft and the start of the new year. That's probably it. Other than that, I don't think there are a ton of really strong options. I mean, again, a lot of this comes down to the contractual portion of it. Like Tyus Jones, I think could do something, um, but it's just like the contract doesn't help the Knicks. So you got to look through all these players and like I. It's to the point where, to me, it's kind of zeroed in on those two guys with the exception of Clarkson. I guess you could say Sexton, but I really don't think he's going to be a target for them. Uh, yeah, like Chris Paul's not going to – the math's not going to work out in the Knicks' favor, really. Uh, I don't – like you could say DeJounte Murray, but – and maybe his market's just that poor that the Knicks, like, screw it, we will do it. So, sure, we could say him. And then I I – don't love this answer, but there's an element that makes sense. Still not my favorite for salary and positional reasons, but like you look at a a Bogdan Bogdanovich type, but even then I just, I don't see it. D'Angelo Russell, of course, his offense is great. His defense is not, if they can ignore that, then that's fine. I just don't see them doing it. So I don't know. It just, it feels like there really aren't a ton of options out there. That makes sense for the Knicks outside of those two guys and and the players I mentioned. I want to be more creative, but realistically speaking, we're kind of getting narrower in terms of what makes sense. So thank you, Hans. Dirty Dancer, do you think it would be wise to offer Precious an extension once the deadline has passed? So the Knicks can't offer Precious uh, Chua an extension this season. Precious Chua was a first-round draft pick. The deadline passed similar in the way that it had passed for Emmanuel quickly. So no extension is possible. It would really be, do they want to re-sign him in free agency? And I'll be honest, I was very much against the idea of Achua being here based on how he was used. He didn't seem like a Knicks-level player, but maybe that's it. Maybe it's simply how he was used and where he's at now. And I think there's some absolute merit in retaining him. I don't think that he would cost particularly much this off season. The market for bigs is not significant. The market for restricted bigs is going to be even smaller. So I don't think that he'll break any bank. Uh, you could use him in sign and trades potentially, but that's a future problem that we can talk about. You can use his salary as continuous soup. Um, you could just use him as a helpful player. Perhaps the Knicks see him as this four or five who can't really shoot, but like can fake shoot He works on corner threes this summer and you get him to like, actually, that's his role. Just do that. Please, Precious, do that. Maybe, maybe you have him as kind of like a ninth, 10th man and you play him regular minutes. And when you have two draft picks, maybe you trade one, maybe you keep another. If you keep that other one, you could go best player available at the two or the three. Maybe you find someone at the one if you don't bring in Rokas. There are options that the Knicks have and, I think it was overlooked to to me at first. It was, yes, obviously we all knew OG Ananobi was the prize of this trade, but I saw Flynn as like, well, they'll find him a new home and they still might. And Precious, I kind of thought was all his injury insurance and there's not going to be much that really comes of it other than that. And to his credit, he's made that mindset of mind change. So he's been killing it. Happy to see it. But no, an extension, not feasible because the CBA won't allow it. But thank you. Uh, Alan, thank you for the Super Jack contribution. You mentioned stair-stepping before, like we trade Flynn for Osman and then him for Burks. Hasn't the league frowned on this cap circumvention? Not re- This wouldn't really be cap circumvention. Cap circumvention would be like um, Joe Smith back in the late 90s with the Timberwolves and everything that was involved there. This wouldn't quite be that way. This would just be creative. Knicks aren't really doing anything that they shouldn't be by 
doing a stair stepping model. Uh, it's just, you know, the same way that they would move salaries in and out. The CBA corrected that with um, a different story, but still a fun one. For those who remember, Luke Ridenauer was on a non-guaranteed contract and he kept getting passed around from team to team. I think he was traded three or four times in a less than two week span. And uh, the NBA said, no, no, we're, we're going to put an end to this because he's on a non-guaranteed contract. The rule is you have to guarantee it in order to do that. Similar was also done with Brendan Haywood when Brock Aller traded him from Cleveland to Portland, created a TPE that then they were able to fill someone into the TPE and then use them in a trade. And before you knew it, it helped lead to a championship in Cleveland. So, uh, but even then that was, that was fixed. Now there's the Haywood loophole. So this isn't against the rules, but I think it's a great point, Alan, where if a team exploited this, I do wonder if with the next CBA, if the league would say, okay, this is actually not something we love, but it doesn't hurt anyone per se, right? Like all those contracts are guaranteed. The Knicks get, what they want no one gets harmed in the process in that scenario like even if we use flynn for osman and uh then for burks like the spurs save money the pistons save money the knicks take on money which they wanted in the first place so i just don't think it would really leave the league in a place where they're like this is unacceptable we can't do this ever again we have to bring down the hammer uh so it's to my understanding it's not something that would be uh cap circumvention per se just more be creative thinking but thank you i appreciate that question and your super chat contribution lumbar do you put into any stock the sny report the knicks are interested in tari eason i i'm not going to criticize the reporting because genuinely don't know i'm sure the knicks would have interest in tari eason because he's overall a good player he's got some blemishes can't finish the rim uh he's pretty inefficient but he is so good defensively. You can have him switch. He's pretty good on catch and shoot threes. So I don't see why the Knicks wouldn't be interested in him. It seems like the Rockets may not be interested in moving him. There was a report in The Athletic that came out that was stating Jabari Smith, Tari Eason. Those are guys the Rockets don't particularly want to move. And they like Whitmore and Thompson. So do I think that could also just be uh, them bluffing? and? You, you, anything that's leaked publicly, you have to think is motive driven. Yes, 100%. It could be, yeah, we don't want to give up Tari Eason and they get a good package. Like, well, we're actually comfortable with it because we have all these forwards and there's just so much playing time and, and all that. So maybe it changes. I, I would imagine that there is interest. He seems like the type of player that the Knicks would be interested in. Where the playing time comes from, not entirely sure when Julius comes back. It's not, I don't think Eason's healthy right now either. And it's you're in a worse spot. Like there were worse spots to be in, I should say, than having Tari Eason. But I'm still I just don't want to move Quentin Grimes bid season. I know I said that in the last episode of Cream, but I just don't love it unless it's for a player like Eason. If it's a consolidation trade, then I'm I'm really not a huge fan. Again, it's hard for me to to completely preempt it. I need to see it in order to see how I feel about it. I would rather just hang on to Grimes until the summer and trade from excess then, especially with players being hurt. So would rather it not be the case. And maybe these other injuries lingering, perhaps that changes the Knicks mindset. Maybe it doesn't. No clue. But Eason, I gather they would be interested in him because he does things that they do like. So, uh, yeah. Let's see if Tar Eason's a Nick. Tingus Pingus, thank you for the super chat contribution, sir. Uh, hey, Jeremy, ran into, I assume, sir, got a Porzingis uh, profile, so I'll thank Christoph Porzingis, if anything. Hey, Jeremy, ran into Leon Rose, confidant, two years ago before the deadline. Interestingly mentioned, Leon was ready to trade anyone, especially RJ, for the right deal. Just rereading this. Mentioned Leon was ready to trade anyone, especially RJ, for the right deal. Okay, that makes sense. Two years ago, the Knicks were having their worst season relatively speaking that we'd seen uh so i don't even think it would be worse it was the worst season in the last four years include this one that's pretty obvious in terms of what you're saying i get it i think that makes a lot of sense julius randall we were talking about him as someone who was it a fluky season that he had with open gym i mean he was called an open gym merchant by 
so many fans. Uh, they had too many players. Cam Reddish wasn't was acquired, didn't have a role to play, and then wasn't able to really do much, and then wasn't playing super well. But that hadn't happened yet, of course. That was just that part. Um, I'm sure that there was no one on the roster that the Knicks felt they had to keep. And I think the RJ portion is exactly what we're looking at with this team right now. Based on RJ's play style, it just wasn't conducive to what the Knicks wanted. It still isn't. That's just not RJ's game. It's not quite as similar to that when you have Randall on the team. And of course, they didn't have Brunson then, but they knew, I mean, they must have known ahead of time, we could probably get Jalen Brunson in here if we can't trade for him and some sort of, hey, Jalen, got some got some nice cash for you. So I'm not surprised, Tingus Pingus. This, this makes a lot of sense that they would be open in such a bad season with a team that was mostly veteran-focused and that they just didn't believe in a lot of the young players, especially the ones that they didn't draft. So interesting insight. I, I It sounds about right because their moves have also registered that exactly. So thank you for the Super Chat contribution. Uh, Brzez Penagonda, what is the date you need to get under the tax? It's the end of the season. The only issue is, and by end of the season, I mean like the fiscal year. So I guess June 30th, if the new year starts July 1st, depending on, that's probably what it would be. The thing is, you can't trade expiring free agents. So you can only move contracts that are under contract through the, the next season. That's where it gets especially dicey. Now, maybe it's a sort of point where you could move uh, a non-guaranteed contract into a traded player exception and uh, thank a team that way. But it's these things can be solved last minute. They have It has happened before, and it will happen again. But from the Knicks' vantage point, especially as they try to keep building and likely adding more salary to the books, it's harder for them. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just harder for them, which is why any move that they make also will dictate what can and can't happen between now and July 1st, because it'll be fascinating to see, well, the Knicks have this much money committed. Okay, well, if they wanted to get this star and they didn't want to do it in the new calendar year, it'd have to be up to this amount. Um, but we'll cross that bridge as well. But it's a good question. It's the end of the fiscal year NBA style, which would probably be June 30th. Jacob Slavit, thank you for the Super Chat contribution. Hey, Jeremy, want your opinions on three possible names. All right. D'Lo, Harrison Barnes, Al Kuzma, mainly for continuous soup. Thanks for all your great work. Thank you. Appreciate this. So uh, we'll start with D'Lo. Just talked about him very briefly. The offense is good. I mean, he's hot and cold. He's such a fascinating player. Uh, Sam Vecini brought this up where he's the type of player where like former number two overall pick played in the biggest markets, been an all-star benefit of playing with LeBron. I feel like he just goes so hot and cold that you don't quite know which D'Angelo Russell you're going to get. And that could be problematic. Now, the other two position, uh, the other two players you mentioned, Jacob are certainly not lead guards. So it's really a matter of finding minutes for them. I would, I want to say that Barnes, if you will, I'll just instead look it up because Barnes and Kuzma play a lot of minutes. Harrison Barnes plays 30 minutes a game. Kuzma probably plays more than that. He has to he plays 31.4. So if you're bringing these players in, where is the time coming? Who are you giving up? These are three fours. If you want to call them that you had Ananobi, presumably Randall's back. Uh, you could do it. You just, you run the risk again of not having a primary ball handler. And then if Randall does indeed come back this season, it's extremely crowded and it's just not spaced very well. And you have multiple players who operate more like fours than not. So if anything, I think the fascinating thing would be if Barnes and Kuzma switch teams, but that obviously doesn't impact the Knicks uh, as well. So I get the mindset for continuous soup. And I think for all of them, but more for Kuzma continuous soup makes sense next year. Um, Harrison Barnes, I'm just going to quickly look up what his contract is because I know he made a good amount. So he signed three for 54 million. So he's in the, the D'Lo camp where he's making a good amount. He could be continuous soup. 
I wish that it were a few million dollars more, um, like that Brogdon Brown Kuzma tier, but it's okay. You can find ways to make it up. It's more positionally. I don't think it works super well for the Knicks, but I, I appreciate the question in the super chat. So thank you very much. Kevin Danishevsky. Hey, Jeremy. I have a tradition that when the Knicks hit a new high, I watch an old KFS video from when things were bad. I watched a video from February 22nd when you suggested Leon would have gotten JB in. I assume there's more to this question. There is. In a KP trade, can you go through how that alternative history might have played out? So JB in the Kristaps Porzingis trade. I mean, it would have, without knowing exactly the math, because it was, the minutia was a while ago. The best thing that could have happened in that trade was the Knicks getting Brunson instead of Dennis Smith Jr. That's how I felt at the time. Now it's a very easy answer. Uh, how they would have done it, I mean, they probably would have, if they needed to make up money for the salary, they could have done that. But Jalen Brunson at that point was just a backup point guard that had been taken in the second round. So the frustrating part is that if there were a front office that, um, specifically Steve Mills, if Steve Mills knew how to run a basketball team, then he would have realized, okay, Dennis Smith Jr. not working with Luka Doncic. Perhaps, I don't know, there's a reason that's not happening. And also perhaps the wonderkind who's there is not the problem. Maybe it's that Dennis Smith Jr. isn't the best fit with him, but Luka Doncic also can fit in a variety of teams because of how versatile he is. So maybe that's not the player that we should go after. And if they really needed a point guard, that Brunson was the easy answer on the table. Even before he was Jalen Brunson, before he was, look at that guy go in the Western Conference Finals, he was an option. And the way that it would have worked, I think you probably could have even gotten, and I, I don't know, it wasn't in the room, I, I have no idea. But my guess is that the Knicks really wanted to headline this trade with a name. You're trading the best player that you've had since Carmelo Anthony, which wasn't that long ago, but still noteworthy. You need something back. When front offices trade with each other, they need to be able to sell something to the franchise, specifically to the fans. The fans need to know something to cheer for. And on that day, when fans go from, oh, okay, it seems like there's some unhappiness to, wait, he's gone? To, oh my God, he's he's gone. What did we get back? And it's expiring contracts and the hope of getting two max players and you didn't get any of the ones that you wanted. You need a name. And that's what Dennis Smith Jr. was. It was a name. It was, hey, look at this recent lottery pick that we got and we were able to trade him for, uh, trade get him for Christoph Sporzingis and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, that's really all it would have been. I think the Knicks could have even maybe gotten more out of that package, squeezed a little bit more because obviously the Mavs were keen on moving Dennis Smith Jr., but bad job by the Knicks to prioritize Dennis Smith Jr. in such a way. So, Kevin, I'm glad you're rewatching old episodes. More power to you. Uh, I, I, if, I'm sure it feels good to watch any of those times, knowing times are good, so definitely the right mindset. But kudos to you for going back because uh, I leave – well, like most of those pods in the in the rear view mirror, but I, this is a good question, so thank you, Jacob Slavitt. Uh, oh, we already this Jacob already asked this one, but I appreciate seeing his lovely face again. Darren Hood, I have a question, Jeremy. What do you see the Knicks doing with either Grimes or Fournier at the trade deadline? I mean, to me, Fournier feels gone. It feels inevitable. It's just a matter of what city he will reside in for the next couple months. Grimes is the one I really can't put my finger on it. And I know there was sentiment among the beat reporters that Grimes would likely be traded. And I'm not disagreeing with that. I just think that since that was said, with more injuries happening, I wonder how conservative the Knicks will be in their approach. I don't, I don't, the Knicks aren't the type of team that really shifts gears quite a lot. But with Randall being injured and them having an understanding of it in the timeline, I could see them saying, like, we're not going to change our plans because Julius is hurt. We're going to do what's best for us. No way. But again, it depends on when's Julius coming back. How's he going to look? And all of those factors. My guess is still, I'll say 98% that Fournier is gone. And I'll say 70% that Grimes is gone. With the 30% caveat being, yeah, they just, they need healthy bodies. They need good 
players and it's hard to, it's hard for me to rationalize moving Grimes depending on what the return is but there aren't a lot of options where I'm like that's it that's the one great go for it it's over you have to do it so I I don't know I, I'll go with you know, I'll I'll say they move they definitely move Fournier and they probably move Grimes but I hope they don't move Grimes I I hope if they're going to do it just save it for the off season I'm totally comfortable moving Grimes I think there is not a plausible world where he's here past July so if that's the case I'd rather just sell it when we're not in the midst of a season and I'm not jumping out the window like John about uh like believing because because I'm kind of there not even kind of I am I am there I don't I don't know why I'm reluctant this team's really friggin' good so why you would kind of potentially hurt yourself I don't know but again it depends on what comes in the door? Oh, yes, sir. Hold on a second. Okay, are you are you trying to tell me that you've jumped out the window too? Oh yeah, but I but I don't know why this is a surprise. I've, I've just I've been we are on the record. You have jumped out the window, Jeremy. Yeah, no, I I I I feel like I've been leaning out the window enough with my predictions that I've been positive and, and optimistic about the team. But yeah, I've I've jumped as well. I I don't think it's quite the fan. Hell thing. yeah! There he is. Should have seen that coming. Should have seen that coming, and yet it's a party, folks. It yeah. You know <laughs> that's the thing, Andrew. You can you can see cream coming, but you can't see that coming. Raising. There you go. There Next we go. Up. There we go. Khalil from Brooklyn. Jeremy, my guy. Uh, thoughts on targeting Jeremy Grant allows you to move OG to the two and add a lot of length and switchability. Can cover for Randall now. Make him expendable later in a superstar trade. Uh, first of all, great to see you, Khalil, at the game recently. Fun running into you, buddy. In terms of this, this reminds me of the concerns that I personally had where it was, Hey, what if you moved Fournier and IQ or Fournier and whatever for, uh, for OG and an OB. And then you had RJ OG and Randall. And I know this isn't the same. This is very different, but to me, this feels like you now have three players that are fours or may better operate as fours. You know, OG, you kind of play him a lot of spots, but it just feels very clunky. It feels large. It doesn't feel like there's a lot of quick movement. I also am not the biggest Jeremy Grant fan. I I like him. I think his offense is great. I think his defense has gotten a very nice reputation with results that haven't quite been there uh, since he kind of asserted himself. So it does make Randall expendable. But I also still feel like the best way to keep moving forward with this team, and it's open to interpretation, try to this summer uh, kind of like assemble your assets so that you add a third All-NBA player onto this team and not two. Because like, let's say it's Embiid, theoretically speaking. You run the risk of if you moved Randall, yeah, you have Grant there. That's great. But you're now going from two all-NBA players to two all-NBA players. And obviously Embiid and Randall, we can call them both all-NBA players, but one's MVP and one is not. Uh, but if and when Embiid gets hurt, then you're left with Brunson and Grant and OG and DiVincenzo and Hart and Stein. Uh, which good team, don't get me wrong. But also, what if you just kept Julius and built around him and Brunson? Or built, sorry, I still don't think they're building around Julius. They're building around Jalen. They're building with Julius. He's more expendable. He is expendable. Jalen is not. But if you can add a third elite player, like top 25, let's, if you consider Julius to be a top 30 player, whatever you want to call him, Let's say you add another top 30 player to that team, one who's even better than Ju than Jalen Brunson. That, to me, is better than the alternative, which was, hey, we have Jeremy Grant in the building. We use Julius to get that superior player. 
just keep adding more talent. So I get the, the premise. It also, for whatever reason, and who knows if this is the case, Blazers don't seem to want to move Jeremy Grant. I think that they probably figure we're losing anyway. We like having him on the roster because he commands attention that helps our younger players grow. Might as well do it. I I get the length and switchability. I don't love the fit. I don't love the positioning. And I just don't think he's a I just don't think he's as good enough of a player to to make that challenge. Um so that's where I'm at, but I appreciate Khalil. Thank you very much. Mythic Monty, thank you for the super chat contribution. Question for you, evil goatee Jeremy. There is a beard here. I just want to be clear. It does it doesn't grow in very well on the sides. And I know you you really only see me straight on for the most time, but there is there's sides here. Just the goatee, I I wouldn't it wouldn't look great. It just wouldn't. But um, I'll take it. The evil goatee. Uh, will the Knicks be able to re-sign OG, iHeart, and Presh without trading away one or both first-round picks as well? It really depends. There are a lot of variables that are at play, and I'm going to go over all of them this summer. So this will be a great question that I have already kind of thought through. Various factors include, uh, I mean, it's all financial. Are they getting a superstar? Are they getting a player that makes more money that ups their payroll? Uh, yes. Do they want two players on the roster, two draft picks on the roster, period? If they don't and they wanted to trade one, do they keep the other? Is that because of the finances or is that because they just have a stacked roster and there would be no playing time? Ultimately, I think it is somewhere in the middle. I think it's going to be the Knicks have financial concerns with players and paying and all of that. And they also don't need two first round picks in this draft because of how many players they have. So I, I'm going to say, no, I'm going to say uh, there is not a plausible world in my mind as things stand right now where the Knicks keep those three players and also have their two first round picks, but we will explore all of those opportunities this summer. But uh, so thank you, Mythic Monty for giving a, a nice little teaser for what fans will be able to listen to at a later date. Ben Kim Gurvey, two questions. Could we add Rokas for the playoffs? When is the last day to add to the playoff eligible roster? Rokas could be added to this roster. Yes. The only thing is the Knicks would have to sign him. Uh, it'd be up to two years, right? It'd be the biannual. They could do a portion of the biannual exception, or they could do the minimum salary, but keep in mind this counts as a year. So that means they'd only have one year of team control of Rokas. So I don't see it. And especially with the buyout process in Europe, my guess is just not tenable. And uh, I believe the last day to add to the playoff eligible roster might be March 1st, if memory serves, but um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's March 1st. I, f I feel moderately to decently confident about that answer. Thank you, Ben. Josh, a.k.a. Uncle Fulio. Thank you for the Super Chat contribution. If Knicks trade for DeRozan, then re-sign him, would convincing OG to pick up his player option keep the Knicks out of the second apron next year? That's a great question and one that is potentially stepping on a uh, future cap or no cap. But that's totally fine because I will uh, answer it in the DeRozan lens. Uh, it would be difficult no matter what, depending on what DeRozan is making, because it also challenges the Knicks in other ways. There is a world where they could accomplish this, but it's difficult. But I very much like where your head is at in terms of the player option, because I guess I'll, I'll go on record now. It's January, plenty of time for things to change. Um, my bold prediction is he opts in. So I'm going to let that linger. I will elaborate at a later point, but that's where I'm at. I think he's going to opt in. Uh, I think he'll opt in and extend because I'll tell you, the Knicks getting him December 30th, six months, June 30th, July 1st, new league year, money resets, hard cap restrictions gone. Sometimes a little too easy. And uh, just saying, if you wanted someone to cooperate, maybe the person who runs the team having that player be repped by the team runner's son maybe it helps 
So uh, it's a great question, Josh. Thank you. JG, question. Hi, Jeremy. Appreciate you and align with a lot of your line of thinking. If you don't want to trade Grimes, who would you be willing to part ways with? Because it sounds like you want to stand pat. I don't want to stand pat. Just to be clear, I don't want to stand pat. I still would like to lean on a structure that involves Fournier and um, say like the Bucks first round pick. I mean, if you can get away with the Wizards first round pick, be my guest, right? Like if I am calling up Toronto and I'm saying, hey, Toronto, obviously you'll do your thing, but our offer is Fournier and the Washington first. Now, the Raptors might laugh and say no. And if they do, then that's totally valid. But there's something also about the optics, which is, okay, is Bruce Brown really going to net them an unprotected first? Absolutely not. Is he going to net them a protected first? Probably. Um, What will the protections on that first be? What team actually wants to give up something that's worthy of that? Like the Lakers have been very interested in Bruce Brown, according to reports. Do they want to give up what's really their only asset of a 2029 first round pick? Probably not. If they did, They'd heavily protect it. Is that protection going to be for Brown that much better than the Wizards first? I really don't know. But there's an optics thing where if the Raptors just wanted to get something, in the moment, you can win that trade by saying we got a first-round pick for him. Of course, it doesn't necessarily convey. But the Spurs, what was the haul with DeJounte Murray? Even though it didn't seem like that pick might have conveyed based on how the Hornets were treading, and maybe there's some revisionist history there too, but just even still, it was like three first round picks. That's that's the sell. And then a couple of years later, it's yeah, well, it didn't convey. So that's my thinking. If you can use one of the protected first round picks, do that. But I get it. You have Deuce McBride. You've got Quentin Grimes. You're adding another good player, theoretically, with Fournier's salary. There are only so many minutes. I don't know how it works when Randall comes back and you now have, assuming everyone's healthy, Mitch aside, Brunson, DiVincenzo, Ananobi, Randall, Hartenstein, the player you've acquired using Fournier's salary in a future pick. McBride, Grimes, Hart, Achua. I guess it'd be Hart and Achua. That's 10. It's tough. He Tibbs doesn't defer to that. So, the way that I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to talk myself into it. It's more just explaining what their logic is of 10 players when healthy is too much for our liking, especially if Mitch comes back and it's 11. So is it too crowded? You've just signed extended deuce. Do you really want him on the bench? Are you comfortable moving Grimes now? If you are, what are you getting back? I, I still look the defense to me grades out so well that I'm by no means saying he is Mr. Untouchable. Like he was, he may have been branded. It's not about not wanting to move Grimes. It's just about thinking, is there a better deal to do it? And I don't know. I really don't know. So kind of like the landmark 1967 U S Supreme court case. uh, I think it was uh, Jack Abellis for via Ohio. Um, It was about porn. What is porn? The ruling, the verdict, it was, I know when I see it. Um, I'll know what a good trade looks like when I see it. So, I don't know why you're looking at me like that. This episode's literally called Cream. You think I wasn't going to talk about historical facts when I can? I love history. I'm going to bring it in, Andrew. Don't look at me like that. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for some reason, I'm inclined to remind everybody that Fred Katz will be on the pod next week. Anyway, yeah, I wonder, I wonder why. Uh, <laughs> Fred, also a fan of history. Thomas Gaffney, has performance of Precious and Sims reduced Nick's possible interest in Drummond? Yeah, I think it's got to be dead by this point. When I was interested in the Knicks getting Drummond, it had everything to do with their missing Mitchell Robinson, and I just just don't trust any other option. And Precious has grown into the role. He has bought in. To me, and this is why the, the the Gafford, the Olenek, any of the other reports just kind of make me scratch my head as to why we're going that direction. So I 
would agree, Thomas. I, I think that this has drastically reduced it. The Bulls are also such a weird team that like they're not they're too good to be bad and they're not and, and they're just bad in general. Um, very mediocre, and they probably see it as, hey, look, we're selling out games like we always do. Let's make a play and push. Let's try to drive revenue. Maybe they move Levine, but that's not really going to impact their race to play in. They're close enough. So uh, it's a great point, Thomas. I, I would like to think that it has squashed it entirely. Uh, Delsky, thank you for the Super Chat contribution. At what point is too much in terms of asking price from Brooklyn if he's ever available for me? Call what you think they'll want in return. I think they will want a lot. And what I mean by a lot, I mean a lot. If they wouldn't even accept their own draft picks from Houston, which gave them free reign to tank, then they're going to want a whole lot more than that. I mean, I gather it would probably involve. I, I mean, like I'll, I'll play along, but it's just, it doesn't feel logical to me at all from their perspective. The, the optics are just so terrible, but if we're, if we're saying what they would want in return, I think it would be multiple unprotected picks uh, in the future. And it would involve probably Randall going to a third team and any value that goes there, but then they, they seem to want win now talent. And do they really want a 29 year old player in Randall? And I don't think they do. So it's probably a three team trade, but then finding a home for Randall or like, I don't know what other piece you're moving that has significant value. Centers don't have significant value on the trade front, especially not when they're injured. So Mitch isn't going to get you a ton Brunson's not going anywhere. OG was just acquired and he's not going anywhere. Uh, but maybe that's it. Maybe the answer is it have to actually it probably would have to be it. It'd have to be OG and picks because their mindset is you want your quote unquote wing stopper who went to Nova. I don't say that as a slight to Brunt to Bridges. I just he's not as good as a, a the defender as as Ananobi is. But if they said you want this guy, fine, it's gonna hurt you. We want Ananobi. We want all these picks. We want Grimes. It's none of this like, hey, Fournier and and Flotsam picks. It's going to be actual, real NBA talent that can help them win games because that's what they seem to want to do as of this moment. They could have completely torn it down. They opted not to. So I don't think they would then tear it down with the Knicks. I appreciate the question, and I thank you for the Super Chat. Dom Cappuccini. Hey, Dom. Thank you for the Super Chat contribution as well. More likely buyout or trade addition. What does your gut say? Buyout target to watch for in your opinion. I would say a trade addition feels much more likely than a buyout. I don't know if does Taj count as a, as a buyout. And I know he wasn't bought out. And I think he's only here for a limited time. By the way, 10-day contract ends at a, I mean, it ends February 9th, I would say officially, if I had to guess. Just doing the math there. But it's not like the Knicks... If they had to remove the roster spot, they just they could waive Taj. He he makes the same money no matter what. They could still sign him to another 10-day contract if they wanted to. So um, it's a good cost-saving move for them, not having to commit to someone, but still having that level of insurance. Buyout-wise, there aren't a lot of players that come to mind. I mean, it would really have to be players probably over 30 that just don't see much time or aren't very good because if they were really good they would cost something like i mean lowry was shooting well and then had a week seven game stretch i want to say but that you know didn't really help them uh, i don't think he'll be bought out and if he were bought out i think he's just gonna go to the sixers instead hayward do you really trust him if you're the knicks yes I, they tried to sign him in 2020 yes tibbs probably loves him but i think that they're they're pretty set. He's also not the best corner shooter uh, to my knowledge. The three point shooting has kind of fallen off. He's more of a mid range player. I don't think that he fits exactly what they need. I know that good is also the enemy of perfect. Perfect's the enemy of good. So I just don't see a ton of options as I scroll through players who are over 30 that could work. I like the Pistons are going to want to win games. If they don't move Alec Burks, are they really going to buy him out? I'm skeptical. 
and there are a lot of other players that are just on bad teams that are in their thirties and you're not going to get players that are really worthwhile who are in their twenties. And, you know, like Tory Craig, like I don't think he's going to get bought out. He's injured. Doesn't seem like the most viable option. Gallinari is not going to really help the Knicks. He's on his last legs in a lot of ways. They're, yeah. It's just, it's a very shallow market. And it's not a good one. So I am I feel pretty good about saying the addition would come through the trade front and less so from the buyout market. Buyout market is usually fool's gold. Those players don't help you a ton. They're just nice to have if you really need it. But also, if they see time in the playoffs, you're probably in for a bad time. So thank you, Tom. Great question. Junon, thank you for the super chat contribution. Apology if this was touched on. Just got out of a spar. Just got out of sparring. Can we talk Alec Burks? It just feels like if we're gonna make a move, that he'd be the guy. Why mess up chemistry? Salute Jeremy. Uh, we did talk about Burks. Happy to bring it back though. We mentioned the the tax implication, the salary side stepping that you can do, where if you were to trade someone like Flynn for Patty Mills or Chetty Osman to then trade that player. For Alec Burks, it's something that you would be able to do. You don't have to worry about salary aggregation. It's just bypassing the original rule, which was the salary matching discrepancy. It's, it's legal. You can do it. You can get away with it. You could get Alec Burks. If the Knicks are doing that, I would envision them keeping Evan Fournier for his salary because it just doesn't help them otherwise. I get the Burks addition. They just need to set, they need to ensure that they have continuous soup and Burks isn't that. So if you're not going to trade continuous soup for Burks, which you shouldn't do at least trade expiring for expiring. And maybe you can go about it that way. I do think that he is an option. I think he'd be a better option if the Knicks had a point guard and didn't run him completely on ball because that's just what Tibbs is going to do. I don't hate the addition. I really don't. I just would need to know what else is falling into place for me to feel comfortable with it. But Burks is an older player. He's in his 30s. And the Knicks just haven't sniffed a lot of players in their 30s. Now, yes, did they? do I think that could change? I do. I do think that could change because they were interested in Clarkson and Olenek. Um, and they were interested in Brogdon. Or at least they had talked about Brogdon at some point. Um so it's not like, and, and Burks, like there's been interest. So I'm not saying it's impossible or necessarily implausible, but if you're going to get Alec Burks, make sure it is for a player that is on an expiring contract and not anyone you would continuously soup. Fargo Tufo. Thank you, Alex, for the Super Chat contribution. My buddy Juanon wants to trade for LeBron. Do we have the salary to make it work? For the record, I am against it, but my buddy loves him. I've had this thought, like, cause, cause, how could you not, right? With everything happening, happening in LA, and the cynical, not even cynical part. It's almost like the, like what the what the right word for it is. Maybe it's the jaded part of me is like, oh yeah, LeBron, you want to come to New York? Get in line, sign the veteran minimum. But it, like, that's also crazy because it's LeBron James, and why would he do that? In terms of getting to the salary point, mid season, it, I mean. Off the top of my head, it'd probably be something like Fournier and Randall that likely gets you somewhere in that ballpark. Like, yeah. So if you're just asking Alex for the salary to work, it does. You could you could find a way. But for the other parts of it, like, I doubt it. I, again, if he really wants to stop running from the grind, he could sign that minimum contract this summer. And we could we could really go nuts. That would be hilarious. And what better way, LeBron, to uh, help build your legacy if you're not going to catch Michael Jordan win a ring in New York? And, uh, I mean, to us, that'll be worth your weight where you're better than Michael Jordan. You're my goat. Like, that's that's the way it'll work, LeBron. But, uh, yeah, so there's salary that can work, Alex. The realistic part of it is a different story. But thank you for that. Tingus Pingus. What would it take for Chris Dunn? Does he fit? I don't see the fit. Chris Dunn's also making very little money, so it's pretty easy. Knicks could just absorb him into a traded player exception. For me, Dunn, 
His three point shooting last I checked was good this year, but it all it's also on limited uh, attempts, limited frequency. The defense has been fine. He's in a he's in a great role in Utah, and I think that's the main point that Danny Ainge and Will Hardy have found a way to use Chris Dunn to their advantage. He strikes me as someone who fits their system perfectly. I don't see him fitting this one. And we're privileged enough to talk about who fits and who doesn't without feeling like, how could you turn this player away? Chris Dunn strikes me as someone who would not be the best fit involved in New York. I don't love it here. And I think Utah benefits more from actually keeping him. But thank you for that. Any more questions? Andrew, how are we doing? I think that'll do it. I was okay. working on a joke to wrap up the show, but... But it um, didn't come to on. you? It didn't come... Um... I, I don't know what you're talking... I just I just said a statement. Um... Sorry. Interesting in- interesting show when you... Mm. You just had to beat me, beat that, beat me to that one, didn't you? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a little prick, so what do you mm. expect? Oh, what do you know? A question just showed up. Oh, Andrew Claudio. Hi, Jeremy. Big fan with an important question. Top three artist bands that get you on the dance floor slash cam not named David Guetta. Um, great question. That's that's fantastic. I'm going to go with just like in the moment right now as opposed to forever, but I'll mix in a little bit. Uh, number one, I think that uh, I think one more time by Daft Punk. One of the greatest songs ever. Truly. That's a bop. Like, yeah. It, it's not only is a bop, but the way that uh, if you look at how they came to the beat, like how they mixed it, I swear that was not a cream pun, uh, that it, it's incredible how they were able to splice it. And the technology they use, awesome stuff. I'll say that's number one. Disco, I'm a huge like disco fan. So uh, I'll say definitely a BG song. But if it's not, I mean, Staying Alive is a classic, yes. But I think Night um, Night Fever, oh, I'm blank on the name. Yeah, I think that's it. That's yeah. a great one, too. Night Fever, Night Fever. Yeah. That's all. Exactly. That, that one. I'll say that. And then another one. I, so one of my favorite bands, this is not planned. Uh, it's called The Knox. They're fantastic. Love their stuff. It's spelled the same way as with, without, uh, instead of an I, it's an O. They've got a great song out there uh, called Slow Song. That's the, their big disco, funk, uh, electronic, synth. They do a lot of that stuff. So I'll, I'll say that one, but I'll do honorable mention to, I know it's an oldie and now it's a throwback and now everyone probably hates it because they hear it all the time. Murder on the Dance Floor. It's a bop, man. That slaps so hard. And I just saw, I finally saw Saltburn this past mm-hmm. weekend, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, I'm not even going to go there with any Saltburn jokes or puns with pre. Yeah. That's, that's too much. But that is, I mean, I still can't stop listening to it. And I don't know when I will get tired of it. It might be next month. It might be next year. It might be 30 years from now. But it's a great song. So I'll say those are the three. They're asking us to record a disco album. So maybe that's our summer project that we record a disco, a KFS oh, yeah. disco album. There you go. Or we'll just do a, a music video for all of these, like compile the best songs and we'll dance to them. We'll do it on, on a green screen. And we'll get we'll get friends of the pod to come in there. Like, you want to see Fred Katz break it down to uh, September? We got him. There that's you so go. Fine. Getty and yeah. Bagley up, up here and just yeah. the whole beat. Yeah, yeah. the whole beat. Exactly. Who, like who's come out from retirement? Mark Berman. Oh, just, just bust a move. <laughs> bust a move. It's great. One serious question that's actually going to lead to just a plug and then you could sign off. So shout out to Big Nick Energy watching along with us tonight. Hey, so asked about uh, how Burks works from a trade standpoint, as has been previously uh, referred to and answered. Like the salary doesn't match a one for one with Fournier. Um, shout out to Ian Bagley, who is on the pod tomorrow. He recorded earlier with John. He has the answer to your question. So anybody that wants to know how a Alec Burks trade works, um, tune in to the next film school podcast. It drops at midnight tonight, both on our YouTube channel and of course on the podcast feed. 
and he will enlighten you how the uh, we both know the answer, but we'd rather you like we, we'd rather plug it and do a Mike Greenberg tease pre tune to the Knicks Home School podcast later. So thank you, big Nick Energy. Love the name, love the the stuff you do. Uh, but everybody go tune into the KFS pod later on tonight. And that will wrap it up, Jeremy. There we go. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Uh, if you're listening to this on the KFS podcast feed, uh, go ahead and leave a five-star review or five-star rating and a review. That would be fantastic. We, uh, I know I've teased the whole thing with uh, a KFS game at Mass Square Garden. We are almost full at that point. Um, but I do want to say I'm if there's significant interest across the board, then maybe we try to get a second game. Uh, our second lounge of that game. So uh, working on it, we're going to, we're going to gauge interest over the next few days to get an understanding. I uh, don't want to make any open, empty promises. Just tell me where we're at because figure while I have your attention, we'd love to mention it. And if we can make it work, then that's great. And if we can't, we'll find another time to do it. So uh, thank you all. Check out the uh, podcast with John and Ian that Andrew mentioned. I'll be back. In a, in a few days, I'll be on a watch along that we're doing. If you're a, a patron, John, and I will be back on Sunday or Monday, I guess. And then next week, we'll have all sorts of festivities. So thanks so much. Have a great week. Let's go next.